In this lesson, we want to talk about how to find the inverse of a function with a restricted domain. So in a lot of cases, you're going to come across a one-to-one -one function that has an inverse, but that also has a domain restriction involved. So a lot of these that you're going to see in your book are going to involve kind of square roots. So something like f of x equals the square root of x plus 1. So we're going to see this as a one-to-one -one function, and it does have an inverse, but we have to be really careful when we calculate it, okay? So let me explain why. First and foremost, we know this has a domain restriction because when we work with the set of real numbers, we cannot take the square root of a negative. And unless somebody specifically tells you otherwise, you're working with a set of real numbers. So we have the square root of x plus 1. We know that this part right here cannot be less than 0. So x plus 1 has to be greater than or equal to 0. It can be 0. That's fine. Square root of 0 is 0. You're okay. But it can't be negative. If you get square root of negative 1, you get into complex numbers or you say there's no real solution. All right. So from here, I can solve this by just subtracting 1 away from each side. Cancel that out and say x is greater than or equal to negative 1. So let's just list this here and just say that this is valid for x that is greater than or equal to negative 1. Okay. Now, if we look at this graphically, we can clearly see that this guy is a one-to-one -one function, right? It passes the horizontal line test with flying colors. But we can also see that our domain restriction is here, right? You can see this point right there, which is the point negative one comma zero, okay? That's the leftmost point on this graph. So for any x value to the left of that, it doesn't exist on this graph. It's going to be either negative 1 for the x value or anything to the right or anything larger going out to positive infinity. Now let's think about if we found the inverse of this guy without considering the domain restriction. What's going to happen? So let's go ahead and say this is y equals the square root of x plus 1. Let's swap x and y. So I'm going to swap this and I'm going to swap this. So I'm going to say this is x equals the square root of y plus 1. And then to get rid of this kind of radical here, I'm just going to square both sides. So I'm going to have that x squared is equal to, this will cancel with this, and I'll have this y plus 1 here, so just y plus 1. Because I want my y, what I'm solving for on the left, that's just how I like it, I'm just going to go ahead and flip this guy. It's completely legal. So I'm going to say y plus 1 is equal to x squared. And then to solve for y, all I need to do is subtract, and I meant to use a marker there, subtract 1 away from each side of the equation. This will cancel, of course, and you get y is equal to x squared minus 1. Now, in most cases, we would stop and say this is the inverse, right? So we would erase this and say f, and let me kind of slide this down because I'm going to run out of room. So we'll say f inverse of x is equal to x squared minus 1. But then you'd scratch your head and say, hmm, I don't think that's true because this, if I had g of x equals x squared minus 1, that's not a one-to-one -one function. So what's going on? So let's take a look at that graphically. This is, let's just say g of x equals x squared minus 1, right? So if I had g of x equals x squared and then I shifted it down one unit, that's this graph here. So this thing would fail the horizontal line test like crazy, right? You can make a bunch of different horizontal lines that would fail all over the place. So what do we need to do to fix this? Well, we need to impose a domain restriction. So let's go down here and consider these two graphs side by side. I want to think about the domain of this one and then what should be the domain of this one, okay? If we consider that this guy is going to end up being the inverse. Well, let me kind of go down and isolate this one for a moment and we can think about this further. When we find the inverse of a function, we swap the x and y values. So what that tells me is that the domain, okay, from the first one, let's just say f of x, becomes the range in the inverse, f inverse of x. So if I consider my f of x function, and I just think about my domain, well, we already know that it's the set of all x such that x is greater than or equal to negative 1. We found that earlier. But what about my range? We can look at the graph and see this, or you can go back and play around with the equation, but you can easily see from the graph that the lowest point is again here, which is at negative one comma zero. Every other point on that graph is going up and it's gonna go out to positive infinity. So the range we could say is the set of all y, let me make that a little better. So we'll say the set of all y such that y is greater than or equal to zero, right? It can be zero or anything larger. Now, because the x and the y's get swapped when we think about the inverse, 
So let me do this in a different color. If I do F inverse of X, well, now what's going to happen is the domain takes on the range. So it would be the set of all X such that X is greater than or equal to zero. And the range would take on the domain. So it would be the set of all Y such that Y is greater than or equal to negative one. And if we want to see this graphically, I've already plotted the function f of x, which is in blue. So this is f of x. And I've plotted the inverse, which is this guy in, I guess that's orange, I'm not really sure. So f inverse of x is right there. And you can see that we've kind of cut the left side of the parabola off. We got rid of it completely. We only considered x values that were greater than or equal to zero. So this is kind of the start of this thing when you consider the x values. It's the x value of zero. And then it continues out to positive infinity. And a couple of things you can notice about the graph and its inverse. The first thing is, if you graph the line y equals x, which is this guy in red, maybe pink, not sure. So let's say y equals x, but it's this line right here. What happens is when you have a graph and its inverse, you can take a given point and reflect it across this line y equals x, and you'll come over here. So this point right here is 8 comma 3. So this is 8 comma 3. If I fold it across the line y equals x, I'll come over here to 3 comma 8. So again, you can see that the x and the y values just swapped. Okay, that's all you're really doing. And you can take other points. If I took this one right here, this is 3 comma 2. Fold it across the line, I get to 2 comma 3. Okay, so on and so forth. You can take this point, fold it across the line, get to there. This point, fold it across the line, get to there. Again, so on and so forth. So if we go back to right here where we wrote this, we need to put a domain restriction in for this to be valid. We can't say that this is true right now. Okay, so let's copy this and slide it over here. And we're just going to put a comma here and say that x needs to be greater than or equal to zero. And for this one, x needs to be greater than or equal to negative one. So this is how you would want to list this. This function does have an inverse. It's this, but with a restricted domain. Now, I want to prove this to you even further. Let's go down to a fresh sheet. And let's just write f of x is equal to the square root of x plus 1. And I'm going to write the other one as just g of x, just so I can save a little bit of that notation that makes everyone crazy. So I'm going to say this is x squared minus 1. Okay. So if I don't consider any domain restrictions, what happens is when you do the check, remember you have this f of g of x is equal to x and remember that g of f of x is equal to x as well one of them is going to fail and it's going to fail and so a lot of people because they don't remember the kind of rules that we talked about with basic algebra they're going to think it didn't fail so let me show you this real quick so that you understand what's going on so let's say i try f of g of x so f of g of x so i would take this function here f of g of x and I would plug in right there, I'm plugging this in, okay? So I would take square root of, this is going to be x squared minus 1 and then plus 1, okay? So, so far, everything looks fine and dandy. I know that minus 1 plus 1, that's going to go away. So I have square root of x squared. And a lot of people at this point go, oh, that worked. So this cancels with this and it equals x. It doesn't though. So if you remember back, let me kind of erase this, from kind of the basic stuff we did at the very beginning of the course, we know that the square root of x squared is equal to the absolute value of x. To prove this real quick, let me scroll down, I'll come back up. Let's say I took the square root of something like negative four squared. Okay, I have a negative four. So this is not gonna be equal to negative four, it's gonna be equal to positive four. Why? Because negative four squared is done first. So negative four squared, that quantity is 16. So let me just erase this and say, now you have the square root of 16, which equals positive four. So this became positive. So you have to be careful about this, okay? So it would only be true, let me kind of erase this real quick. It would only be true that if X was greater than zero or equal to zero, that the square root of X squared would be equal to X because the absolute value of x is equal to x if x is greater than or equal to zero. And then the absolute value of x is equal to the negative of x if x is less than zero, okay? But because we put a domain restriction in here, we can throw this case out 
And we could say that, okay, the absolute value of x just equals x because we have x restricted to be greater than or equal to zero. So then we can say that this is actually equal to x because we're following this domain restriction. So that's how we make this work out. Again, if you're not paying attention and you forget that the square root of x squared is equal to the absolute value of x, you'll mistakenly just cross those out and say, this is x, it works out, what's this guy talking about, okay? So you have to be very, very careful about this. So we're gonna come back up here and we're gonna make sure that when we list this, we again, let me kind of slide this down, put our domain restriction in and say x needs to be greater than or equal to zero for this to be true, okay? It's true only when that happens. Now, if we erase this and do the other one, there's no issue, no problem. So we're gonna say g of f of x is gonna be equal to, so instead of x squared, remember I'm plugging this in for x, so I'm gonna have the square root of x plus one, this quantity would be squared and then minus one. No issues here. You can go through and just cancel this away and say this is what? It's x plus one minus one, which equals x, okay? So that's why it's very important to check both of these, okay? That's why we told you that earlier where a lot of people just wanna check one and be done. If you get something like this and you just kind of fly through it and you're not paying attention, you're gonna get the wrong answer. And especially on something like the SATs or the ACTs, they know these are common things that you'll make a mistake on and they're good trap questions. Let's take a look at one more. So suppose we have f of x equals one over the square root of x. So we already know that this guy would have a domain restriction, right? We would say that first and foremost, you can't take the square root of a negative, okay? So we know that x would need to be greater than or equal to zero. And then also it's in the denominator. So x can't be zero, so you can just erase that. So that's my domain restriction. What's my range here? Okay, because I got to think about that. When I do the inverse, I've got to know what the range is because that's going to be my domain in the inverse. I know that I can't plug in a zero there, but if I plug in something that is between zero and one, okay, something in that range. So let's say X was greater than zero and less than one, what's going to happen? Well, the closer I get to zero, remember this is going to become a really, really, really small number, infinitely small if you want it to be. And one divided by some infinitely small number is going to approach infinity. So if X is greater than zero and less than one, we know that the Y value is approaching positive infinity, okay? As we get closer and closer to zero. Now, if X is one, we know Y is just one. And then if X is some larger number, let's say you start getting something like, I don't know, let's say you plug in four. Okay, well, square root of four is two, you get one half. And then as you increase this, it approaches a Y value of zero, but it's never going to actually touch it. So the range here, the range here would be the set of all Y such that Y is greater than zero. So the domain and the range are actually the same. Okay, so the domain is the set of all x such that x is greater than zero. The range is the set of all y such that y is greater than zero. So when I find the inverse, this range here will be the domain. So let's go to a fresh sheet and we'll say that f of x is equal to one over the square root of x. And I'll just go ahead and say that we'll have y is equal to one over the square root of x. I'll interchange or swap x and y. So let me do that over here. I'll say now that we have x is equal to one over square root of y. And what I can do now is square both sides, but actually what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to take this guy. We know that y right now is raised to the one half power. So I can just say this is raised to the one half power. And if I wanted to drag it into the numerator, I could say it was y raised to the power of negative one half. Well, how could I cancel that? Well, I could raise both sides to the power of negative two. So let me raise this side to the power of negative two and this side to the power of negative two. And so I get X to the power of negative two, which is one over X squared is equal to Y, right? Because power to power rule, those guys are gonna cancel and become one. Now, let me erase this over here and erase this. And let's state this as our inverse. We'll say F inverse of X is equal to, we'll have one over X squared, but again, we have to put our domain restriction in here. So we say that X needs to be greater than zero. And again, my F of X is equal to one over the square root of X. 
and we'll say again for the domain here, x is also greater than zero. Now I'll leave it up to you to prove this. You can go back and do the f of g of x, or in this case, because we have this notation, you can say f of f inverse of x is x, and then f inverse of f of x is also x. And you need to do this with the domain restriction. If you don't, in one of the cases, you're going to run into that problem where you have the square root of x squared, and that becomes the absolute value of x. So you're going to have to restrict that domain to kind of clear that up.